large group. Um, Jenny Call is presenting today. Jenny um, presents for Garden Sphere. She's a teacher, elementary teacher, and grew up on a farm and has a sustainable ag degree. And she can tell you a little bit more about herself. She has chickens and ducks and geese and a few other things. And um, so we will just get started and uh, jump into it. So, and I'm Janda, by the way, I'm the Enviro House, which is behind me. That may be open in April, we hope. So. We hope. <laughs> yes, so I am going to go off camera and um, we'll just get started with Jenny. Yeah, sounds good. All right, yes, yeah, so welcome to Urban Chickens and Ducks, how to kind of get yourself started. Um, I am Jenny Call, and I am with Garden Sphere. I have been doing this for a very long time. Um, I am a Pierce County native. I grew up in Fife, and I have a sustainable agriculture degree, but I am also a classroom teacher here in Pierce County, so um, an elementary school teacher, so I teach the littles. Um, I love educating folks about sustainable practices and um, flock care and different animal husbandry issues. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun for me. So I hope you have a, a good time. And if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, pop them in the chat. Um, I'm gonna be checking that chat as we go. And um, yeah, so welcome, I, good morning. Great, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. All right, and we'll get that going. All right, so um, we are going to go ahead and, oh, let's see if I can, hold on a second. I'm gonna unshare that for just a sec and I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second and then I'm gonna share again, um, just cause it'll be easier if I do it this way. There we go. And slideshow. So urban chickens and ducks getting started. Um, there is the garden sphere um, address and phone number and uh, the email address that you can write to if you have questions um, or needs. It is a dot biz, uh, not a dot con. So just know that. Our very first poll question is what is your experience right now with um, chickens and ducks? What are you experiencing? Is it is a little bit, you have friends with them, you kind of grew up with them. Um, you want to give it a try? You want to learn more about it to see if it's something you really are interested in. And if, an, if it's anything else, you can go ahead and um, put it in the chat if you'd like. We have, um... Both participants needing to learn more. Sounds so, good. <laughs> we're at a hundred percent, so we will end our <laughs> share. There we go. All right. So, so chickens. We're going to start with chickens first. Um, chick to adult, and then we'll talk about ducks. I'll kind of do one at a time. That's easier that way um, to kind of digest the information. Um, so when you get a chick, it, um, you, a lot of times people will get them. I know at Garden Sphere, um, we, we order the chicks from a hatchery and the chicks are the day that they hatched, they are sexed rooster or hen or pull it. And um, then they are, are sent to us that, that day. And so they are with us within 24 hours. Um, so the chicks that you get at say a feed store or at garden sphere, um, they are newly hatched. Um, and you're going to need to keep them at about 90 degrees at the floor temperature. Um, and this is because you're mimicking that mother hen sitting on top of them and keeping them nice and toasty. Um, so about 90 degrees in that first, first to second week. Um, you will notice that they, if they get too hot, um, they'll move away from the heat source. 
if they get too cold, they're going to huddle up in a ball underneath the heat source. And if it's just right, kind of like Goldilocks, um, they are going to be scattering all around. They're going to be running. They're going to be really, really active because they're able to go under the heat and then they're able to run around and then get warmed up and run around and get warmed up. So um, you really kind of have to look and see how the temp is doing in there. You can use a thermometer, but really looking at the, the babies is, is going to be way more accurate um, because you're going to tell what they need. Every week, you're going to degree, decrease the temperature by about five degrees each week. And you're going to want to have from hatch to nine weeks, you're going to get what's called chick starter feed. Now there's lots of different varieties, lots of different brands. Um, you have your certified organic, the USDA certified organic feed, and then you have just your standard feed, right? So um, depending on how, how, which way you want to go, right? There's soy free, there's corn free. Um, I do have some customers who they do have soy allergies and actually in the egg themselves, um, it presents in some way. And so they, I, I just inherently use the soy free, um, but you know, it's all kinds of things you can do there. Uh, there, it's a little bit higher in protein and lower in calcium because what you're doing is you're supporting that early growth. Um, not worrying about anything else except giving them a nice strong start. Once all of their neck feathers have grown in, they're considered a pullet and they look like wild teenagers. Um, and so that's, that's, that's kind of that first nine weeks. Um, at about six or seven weeks, depending what time of year, like right now, I would definitely keep the heat source up to eight weeks. But in the summertime, if you get them when it's already warm out and the temp, the air temperature is already very warm, um, I, I, you know, you can take that heat source away as, as early as six weeks. So um, sometimes it's it's more energy efficient uh, to to get chicks in it when it's warmer outside, then you're not having to heat them. But if you keep your house at a higher temperature and you already know you're going to be heating, um, it, you, you can add that to your your heating cost. Um, it's not really a whole lot, um, but it's, it's pretty simple, pretty easy. Um, you're going to need a heat lamp. And this is actually the, the red heat lamp. It's 250 watts. Um, and there is a difference. Um, you don't want to use just a regular. That, that gives them enough heat and produces, produces that higher heat for them, um, especially if you have multiple multiple chicks. It comes in a red, but it also comes in a regular white <laughs> light. So if the red light freaks you out, you can get the 250 watt um, lamp at, um, you know, with a white coloring to it. You totally can. Um, if, you know, and then you're going to get a hood and the hood looks like one of those like reptile aquarium hoods. And you want to get one that has a clamp so you can clamp it at certain spaces. Also, if you want to hang it, you can use that clamping part of the hood and you can hang it. So if you have the clamp uh, attachment, it you end up having more options and how to hang your hood. Um, you're going to need a feeder and a water. Um, you can see there's a demonstration here of this is using the metal feeder and just a glass jar. And they are going to look a little different. So here is the water. And they are a little different and you do want to get those act, those smaller feeder and waters for your chicks. Uh, because if you get the larger ones, what happens is that um, they can fall in the waters and actually drown. Um, they're very susceptible to making poor decisions <laughs> as chicks. So you wanna make sure that you, you're getting the right size um, for whichever, you know, if you get it as a pullet, you're going to want to go a little bigger. If you get it as a newborn chick, then you're going to want to go with that chick water feeder. Um, newspaper is definitely better than using shavings in that first week or two, um, because they can, they can 
kind of have a hard time walking around in the shaving sometimes. And so um, using newspaper for that first week or two um, helps them become way more mobile faster. Um, after that, then I would definitely use the shavings. Um, I got to tell you, if you do do it in the house, um, they do produce a very fine dust. The, the chicks themselves, as well as um, they have this, like, this dander. And so it will produce, the chicks will produce wherever you have them, a very fine dust, and it kind of goes everywhere into the air. So um, just know that you, you're going to have to dust after they've been in the home. Um, in, in their brooder, um, a brooder box, you can use basically anything that is at a minimum three feet high on the sides. Taller is always better. Um, uh, and has a protective um, sheet on top. So you could use um, a window screen, you know, topping on top. Um, they're super curious. Um, chickens inherently are way curious. And so they, as soon as they start being able to get their strength and jump on top of their water and feeder, they, if you have really curious chicks, they are going to want to jump to the edge of your brooder and then jump out. So that's kind of why you want a screen or a protective cover on top. Um, never put a lid on top of your brooder because you will suffocate and kill them. So um, just, in, just a, in some kind of netting. You could use uh, like the bird netting you use on berry bushes and things like that, that totally works. Um, and again, then you're going to want to use starter feed. Um, so, I, you know, I have used in the past uh, hamster cages for my brooders. Um, and then at night, I put a, um, just a, a cover part of it, you know, and um, that seems to work really well until they are at about seven to eight weeks. And then I put them in a larger run. So, uh, you know, those old hamster cages, if you, if you can get your hands on them, they're fantastic. Plus if they're in the house, then you can, they can watch you all the time. And if you have cats, they're protected. If they're dogs, they're, they're protected, but they can interact, which is really, really important when they're little. I'm going to check the chat really quick to see if there are any questions. Oh, no questions yet. All right. If you have any questions or comments, just go ahead and pop those in there. Um, chickens, when they're nine to 18 weeks or nine until they lay their first egg, depending on how um, stubborn your chicken is, <laughs> they are called pullets. Any, any, any chicken under the age of, of, of one can be considered a pullet. Um, that's the time when you're going to transition them to a coop or a run. They are fully feathered. Okay. They don't have that baby fluff anymore. They don't have, um, the crazy teenage fluff and feather look to them, uh, but they are fully feathered. And that means that they are able to regulate their body temperature and they are protected from weather. And so you can put them out in that coop and run, get them comfortable, get them all situated. And you can do one of two things with the feed you can just finish out your starter feed, right? Whatever you have left, just keep feeding it to them, you know, because sometimes you can buy the bigger bags, just keep feeding to them. It's totally fine. Um, and then, or you can just seal that away and use it when you get more chicks. Um, it's good for hmm, about eight months to a year, depending on how you seal it. And um, then you can start feeding them a grower feed. A grower feed has um, a slightly higher calcium, but it is also kind of bulking them up. So they get a lot of, a lot of weight on them, but you know, in general, what I'll do is I'll get the giant bag of starter feed if I need it. And then I just keep feeding that to them until it's all gone. Um, and then I will start switching them over. Um, and generally it, I am hitting it right. You know, I start that layer feed, you know, as they're laying their, their eggs. So, um, it kind of works itself out. You can say, these are really cute. These are little cutie chickens. And then at 19 weeks or older, they will lay their first egg, which is very exciting. Um, they're going to want a nice layer feed, again, certified USDA organic, lots of types. Um, or you can do just standard feed, depending on what you prefer. Um, they will lay really um, consistently up to about their five-year mark. Um, 
And so it's it's really neat. Um, I did have one super, super stubborn Australore. Her name is Angelica. And she did not lay until she was exactly a year old. She was super stubborn. And we like to say that she thought she was too pretty to, to lay an egg. Uh, and so um, she didn't lay until much later. But like if you have a buff Orpington um, or barred rock, Australorps, um, they'll start laying at about four months, which is which is really cool because then you can start getting some eggs now don't be alarmed some of the new eggs that the the first eggs some of them might be super tiny little tiny ones and we like to call those fairy eggs or tiny um little fairy eggs um some of them might be ginormous and that's when you'll in in that first year you you might end up with some double yokers and that's why they're so big um they might have um strange calcium build up on the outside they might have um, no shell um so in that in those first months you know where their their body's adjusting to laying to eggs um there's you might have some surprises and uh, uh we always we always know when we get those really big ones it's like oh it's the double yoker you know who's get who gets to eat the double yoker um um you know it's got good luck all day or something you know like with that, that's kind of like you know or when i'm selling them i'll put the eggs in there and you know they everybody loves to get the double yoker it's a lot of fun a lot of fun let's check on that oh we're doing good all right no ducklings ducklings are very different than baby chicks um they do need to stay warm um i like to keep them at about 70 80 degrees in their space when they are not fully feathered and they need access to water and clean water all the time so i like to do ducklings when i know that i'm going to be home for a couple of weeks in the summer. Again, I'm a classroom teacher, so it's a little bit easier for me to do that um, because I like to make sure that their drinking water is very clean and their swimming water, I can at least change out um, one to two times. When they're really young in the first couple of weeks though, I do watch them when they're swimming. Um, so I'll, I'll fill up the bathtub or I'll put a, a big, tub um, a wash tub or something in the bathtub itself fill it up make sure it's a smaller space and then i'll let them play and discover themselves in the water and they're swimming and playing and cleaning themselves and they do all of these things very inherently um, which is fascinating to watch and then when i see that they're getting a little bit chilly um take them out dry them off in those first couple of weeks two weeks i've so or so I dry them off and then I will put them back where it's nice and warm, um, where they're going to have access to that clean water and clean food. Now, there is, they do require different food. So you're not going to give them chick feed starter feed. There is duckling starter feed, but then there is also what's called a, um, a flock starter, um, you can use that as well. Flock starter is okay to use with the ducklings. Um, their nutrient levels are very different from chicks. And so you really don't wanna feed them the same thing um, because they really do need different nutrients and vitamins. Um, and so as they're developing at about the third week, you're gonna notice that they're getting their feathers they're looking a little funny they're getting into their teenage look there in about week three and they get those those the feathers coming in um it's great to handle them a lot because ducks are a little bit shyer or can be a little bit more standoffish than chicks and, and chickens 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 if they've been handled a lot they they want to be right in your face and they're all about being right next to the human um but ducks sometimes you know you really you really need to imp have them uh imprint on them um so that they will want to hang around you and and um be more interactive with you as they get older once they are fully feathered they can go outside they can go outside in their run um, and into their little duck house. Um, and again, you're going to want to provide um, food for them outside. And also, I like to do a small, a smaller pan of water where they can hop in and do their they're waddling and they're swimming. Um, and then I actually have a sef separate dish for their drinking water that's smaller, that they are less likely to get in. Um, and you're going to use a different 
type of water. I like to use a very shallow, I would say, um, you know, three, two to three inch deep um, and four to six inches wide dish for drinking water for ducklings. Um, and, and then have a larger yet still not going over about four inches um, deep um, pan for them to then swim in. Um, they are gonna need that a little bit differently. Um, and then their food, food uh, is also in the same, I like to use the same type of uh, container for their food. It's gonna be more open um, because when they eat their filter feeders um, and ducks are filter feeders. And so they go in and they eat and then they need that water fairly close so they can filter through. Um, and so they eat and drink very differently than chicks do. Now, depending on the breed, mature ducks can be, begin laying at about four months. Now, I have a blue Swedish, and she was hand-raised with our goose, Harold. Um, it's Harold and Betty. And Betty, our blue, she, she started laying at four months, you know, and she lays five to six eggs every week consistently since she was um, about four months old. Um, and she is, oh, let's see, July, June. May, April. So she's eight months old right now. So in the last four months, she's been laying consistently about five to six eggs every single day. And, and we did, I had, we hand, um, handled them and raised both of them. Um, she is still a little bit needs her three foot of personal space, but she will come over and she will follow me around the yard, you know, so she's got that more personable side. Now the, the adult feed as they get older, um, ducks do need duck feed. Now I know at Garden Sphere, we, we are able to get duck feed and I actually get all of my duck feed from, from Garden Sphere. Um, it's the Modesto duck feed. It's different than the chicken feed. It's very, very different. Um, it, say if you go to um, maybe the feed store, Wilco or tractor supply or something, they do have water fowl feed. Um, and that's what you want. You don't wanna be feeding your ducks the chicken feed or the chicken layer feed. You wanna be feeding them a layer, um, layer meaning they lay eggs, a layer a water fowl feed of some sort, um, because again, their nutrients are very, very different. Um, they're gonna need that. All right, any questions? No questions yet. <laughs> All right, here is our next poll question. What supplements can I give my chickens and my ducks? These are little cuties. You got mealworms, table scraps, cracked corn, seeds, breads. Can everybody see that? Okay. I'll look for questions really quick. When we do the polls, it's a great time to ask a question or if you're curious about a certain breed, we're gonna talk about breeds. Um, I've got a nice chicken breed list. Um, that we have at Garden Sphere. If everybody's through answering, I'm going to end the poll. Sure. Okay. Got one each. <laughs> well, I That's thought great. about. I thought about adding all of the above, but I wasn't sure if that would <laughs> Well, there's, there's other stuff too. I guess, uh, you know, it kind of depends on what your table scraps are too, right? That's great. So some supplements and other goodies you can feed your, your chickens and your ducks. Um, you want to do a supplement of oyster shell. They're going to need calcium. Now the ducks, not as much. Um, but you want to make sure that you've got oyster shell out for chickens to self self feed. So when they know, they know when they're, they, they need it. And so what I like to do is I like to get one of, I like to use the, the plastic, um, chick feeders that you can get, and I fill them up with the supplemental 
um, oyster shell and supplemental grit. Um, that way they can just eat it whenever they need it. They think they need it, go for it. And, and it works great. Um, so as a supplement that you are going to want to keep out for your, your chickens are the oyster shell. Okay. You make sure you have that out for them so they can just eat it when they need it. Um, it helps with their, their calcium calcium levels, keeping them balanced. Now grit, they use that grit. Think of your teeth, right? Our teeth chew things up. Well, the grit are our little tiny rocks essentially, and they eat them. And then it goes right in here and breaks all that stuff down. They eat it. All that grit breaks down their food for them. And so they actually need it. Um, they can get what's called a sour crop. And that's when, um, their the food kind of sits in their crop and is unable to be digested or broken down and and that can be really uh, painful for the chickens and so i'm um, having some grit out there for them is great i like to use like a medium grit uh, size grit not the small not the large i like to use about a medium grit out there um even if you think you have a lot of rocks in your yard still keep some supplemental grit out there because i can guarantee you you don't have enough <laughs> Of, of what they need. Um, now, the rest of these um, snacks, I like to call them snacks more than supplements, um, really are a treat, okay? So think of ice cream, right? Or a bag of Halloween candy or a bag of M&Ms, like a, you know, the family size bag of M&Ms, right? You're, you're not gonna wanna eat it all in one sitting and you're not gonna wanna eat all of that every single day, right? It's a treat. It's, it's a dessert of some sort, you know, once, twice a week, it's totally okay. But giving, uh, it's the same thing with the corn and the mealworms and the flaxseed. Um, there are also uh, soldier flies um, and actually soldier flies. And I did forget to add that to this. Um, they actually are a higher protein source than mealworms. So if you're thinking about adding in a, a different protein source, um, these soldier flies are a much better choice than the mealworms. Um, they are going to have a higher protein source. They are also going to be um, higher in, in uh, a few different um, nutrients. So I forgot to add that here. So um, I'll put that in the chat really quick. They're soldier flies, um, soldier fly larvae. Um, and they're, they're, they're freeze dried. So it's okay. Um, um, so and while you're there, there's a question in the chat too. There is. Um, so, so I've got the soldier flies in there. Um, and so, so again, the corn, um, mealworms and flax seeds, again, you just want to limit how much you give them. Um, maybe your chickens have gone, I, I use it as a way to round my chickens up because I do let them out and run around supervised, definitely not unsupervised, but I let them run around supervised. And when I need to get them all back in the run, say I have to leave, um, then I will, I'll shake a container of, of, um, of my soldier flies and, and I will shake it up and they all come running because I know the sound means treat. Sometimes I'll give them the treat and sometimes I won't. Sometimes I just wanna get them where I want them. <laughs> so, so just know that that's the, those, these are the biggest um, extras and supplements, but definitely put out that oyster shell and that grit. Um, and then the question in the chat says, do runner ducks require a pond or constant water source? Yes. They absolutely do. Just like any of the ducks, you need to have a, a constant water source for them. All ducks do, all waterfowl do. Um, and that goes for geese as well. So I'll talk about that because I've kind of gotten away with, and most people who don't have a pond, they, they do, they're really creative in that. Um, and getting source in that water for them. Um, now your coop and your run, this, this is, this is going to be important for both of your ducks and for your chickens. Um, these, this is where they're going to spend their nights roosting. And for the chickens uh, during the day, this is where they may have their laying box and they're going to lay their eggs. Um, ducks in general will lay very early in the morning. And so they'll lay in their house before you will even let them out of their house um, for the day. So a lot of times ducks are, ducks are early layers. Now for chickens, using pine shavings is your best option. Um, it, 
keeps the ammonia down. It also is easy to clean, easy to compost, and very inexpensive to get. Um, and you're going to want that for the inside of your coop. Um, for ducks inside of their coop, straw is your best option, and, and that is, is way more effective uh, for ducks uh, than, uh, than those pine shavings. Um, and you can get half bales of straw, so you don't have to get a giant bale um, because you do have to keep straw in a closed dry space um, because it does develop mold and mildew and um, you don't want to put wet straw into the duck house um, when when the, when it's in there when you're cleaning it you want to make sure it's free of mold and mildew because um, it can cause tons, really big respiratory issues um, for the run space um, some people use straw some people use sand. Some people just use the bare ground. Um, some people use a combination for their run. Um, I just I I just have the bare ground, um, and we use wood shavings or, or we use wood chips in our chicken run. Now our ducks are mobile. I move them about every other month, so I move them six times a year. And so they'll have the bare ground and then I'll set up a space that has straw so they have a nice space to kind of bed in and nest in if they want to take a nap during the day, because they'll nap on that straw uh, more readily than on the ground that they have eaten all the all the plants from. You want for the run some kind of covered area in part of the run and you want that to be able to cover have a cover over the food and water source and i say that for both of the ducks and for the chickens um, it keeps rain it ke keeps wild bird uh, feces out of your food and your water um, it keeps it protected from any falling leaves or debris that might be in the air um, and you're going to want a small covered area anyway um, for the chickens not so much for the ducks but for the chickens when it's raining and snowing and such um, chickens hate the rain and they hate the snow even more so if you have built in a, a nice covered space for them um, where you're keeping your food and your water and it's a nice dry, stays dry 365 days a year, that's perfect for the chickens. Now the ducks on the other hand, the ducks love it when it rains. It's like getting a bath from the sky. They absolutely love it. And the ducks really don't mind the snow so much either, which is really interesting. Um, and so, so they don't really need a huge covering, but they do need to ha have a spot where their food and water can have some kind of covering over it, um, you know, to keep their food dry. Again, keeping wild bird feces out of the, the food in the water and keeping debris from trees or things in the air out of their water and their food. Um, and that, that, that works pretty well. Um, you're going to want to think about eight to 10 square feet per bird, two to four um, square feet inside of the coop per bird. Um, and because this is because if it's too cramped, um, they'll get very, very stretched, stressed out and um, they may start pecking on or harming each other themselves. Um, a lot of things can happen when an area is too confined. Um, so you want to make sure you've got enough space. Uh, for your your chickens and the ducks outside of their house and inside of their house. Now for both of them, they're really going to spend a minimal amount of time inside of their coop or inside of their, their house um, during the day. Most of their time is going to be spent out in their run or out in their open space, kind of, you know, digging for things. Uh, the chickens will dig and scratch. Um, the ducks, again, are filter feeders. So they're going to be putting their beaks deep into that soil and into the mud and they they like to eat root systems of things so if you have a spot that has a lot of buttercup they will eat the roots of the buttercup and it'll disappear <laughs> so that's a little tip for you um and then we're gonna get to uh let's see the ducklings and ducks need a pool or a water source um and they need as they get older they do need a larger water source I always during the summer, I will buy the, the blue smaller, um, you know, they're not more than maybe eight to 10 inches on the sides pools. And I have them in a few different places. Um, 
So I have them uh, in their duck run. And then if I have one outside of their duck run, because I, you know, I will let my ducks kind of have the lay, you know, do what they want to do when I uh, supervised, supervised outside time, outside of the run time. And I will change that water in the summertime every other day, keeping that pool pretty fresh um, because they do, they, they will poop in their pool um, and, and then they'll start drinking it. Right. Um, and so about every other day in the summertime, I'll change it out. And in the winter, Winter and the fall, I'll change it out probably twice a week just because, you know, my hose will be frozen or something will happen. Um, and this is where um, having those small kids pools, easy to dump, easy to spray out and clean, easy to fill. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll notice that your ducks really have a good time. Every time you fill up that pool and there's fresh water, they are going to dive in there and they are just going to take like mega baths. Like they're going to absolutely love it. So um, you can get away with not having an actual pond pond by using those little kid pools. Um, and that works great. Now for my goose, I got the a little bit larger um, kid pool for my goose. And um, do I do the exact same thing. I'll have two, two pools out in the summertime, um, sometimes three if I'm really feeling generous with my water. Um, and, and then I, I really bring it down to one pool in the winter time. So there's only one pool and they kind of, they hate life. They're like, Oh, why don't you change this more often? And I'm like, my hose is frozen. So, um, but you can get, uh, heaters and I like to use the bird bath heaters. They're about $50 and put that in the pool in the fall and the winter time when we start freezing at night. Like I'm still, um, I still put it in there this past week because we had some below freezing temperatures and I'll put it in the pool and it keeps everything from icing over, keeps that water there. So my ducks have pool access all year round. Um, and then I, for their water dishes, um, there are heated metal water bases that you can plug in, um, run an extension cord out there. And so their water will never freeze either. And so I use a metal, um, a metal low shallow, just like I did when they were a duckling. I'm not using the chicken water. I'm using a, a, a pan, a metal pan that sets on top of that metal heater, um, made for metal, um, waterers and I will change that water out regularly, but I find that they drink more readily when they're using an open pan water rather than using a chicken water. Now you can get the same, that same heater you can use with a metal water and um, it'll keep your water from freezing in the winter months. So that's a, that's a good tip too. But yeah, you are going to need to get, if you have ducks, you absolutely need to get a small kid's pool um, for them because they need that swim time. They need that body time. They like to clean themselves at least two or three times a day and they really do a thorough cleaning and they dive in and and it really is to to help them keep their feathers clean and the oils oils on their feathers uh, any questions no questions all right here is next poll what kind of coop or house would you like to build what you thinking about? Do you want a frame? Do you want it off the ground? Do you want to be able to move it? Do you want it on the ground level? Um, do you want to walk into it? Um, is it okay if you just you know, can reach in and clean it? Um, yeah. Assuming you can see the oh, okay, <clears throat> I see answers coming in. What are you thinking about? What kind of house? And if you're thinking of something completely off the list, go and put that in the chat. Okay, it looks like that's the only answer we're going to get. Okay. Um, so you should join and join us for the the coop um, coop class uh, later the day too. Lots of good stuff. What do we got? Elevated. Okay, I don't know. All right. That's okay. <laughs> All right. So there's lots of types of houses. So there's the A-frame. Um, and that actually is a, a 
almost exact replica of the one that we have that we use when we're um, trying to hatch chicks. We put our broody mama in there with her eggs and, and we let her house up on top and, and have her babies and all that stuff. That's what we use our A-frame for. Um, we have, uh, there's the elevated, the raised coop. So it's up off the ground and has a ramp that'll go down to the ground into the run open run area. Um, and then on the ground as well. So um, there are some advantages and disadvantages of each one. Um, for chickens, the elevated is probably the best choice if they are going to stay in one spot. Um, and you want to have one larger door. You could have one door. Like our elevated is, it only has one door, but the two sides, two side walls actually flip up. So I can hose it down in the summertime once a year when I do a deep clean and I can I can hose the whole thing down open up both sides I can also open up one side and clean it out really really easily but it has just the one door that the chickens use with their ramp going in and out of the house um, some advantages to that is that it brings it up off of the ground it gives you an already ready-made space to put um a nesting box down there put um you can put your food the feed down there with the water underneath um lots of interest depending on how big you make that elevated it also brings it up where um rats are less likely to eat through your home uh, from the from the bottom up um it keeps it elevated in a way um, raccoons are less likely to to play with your coop if it is elevated um so there's some good good advantages to that um, uh, the only disadvantage to a raised coop is that it is stationary. It is going to stay in that one spot and they be, can be quite heavy once built. And so um, it'll take maybe four people to move it depending on, on how big your, your elevated coop is. Um, the A-frame is great. Like I said, we use ours as a broody, uh, broody hen egg um, kind of like a nursery uh, because it's a nice small enclosed space. It has the, the wire mesh down below. Um, we have used it as an isolation coop as well. Say we get a, a chicken from a friend, uh, they can no, no longer have it, we get it and we, we use it as an isolation place. So um, because we do keep our, our chickens that we get new on the property that are adults, we keep them separated from the flock for about a month so we can really keep an eye on that chicken. Um, a disadvantage to this is that design. Um, you are going to have to put an official covered space over it um, because what we have found that with um, rain and snow and everything else, it gets really, really wet. It is not effective at keeping the chickens dry at all, um, but it is a great place for two chickens to be. Two chickens could hang out there, but they do need an additional um, covering overhang or something um, because we found that it just does not keep chickens dry it does not keep their feed dry um, at all as well so that's the disadvantage to that you will have to build another overhang uh, but they are fairly easy to move to um, if you get some rope on those corners you do a lift you can get some wheels that bunch down you can move those they, they can become a tractor um, which is a, a movable chicken enclosure. Um, the one on the ground is okay for chickens, right? You don't need any ramps or anything like that, um, but you are going to have to have some extra security measures um, because the place that they sleep is directly on the ground. Um, and this goes for the A-frame as well. Um, you're going to have to add a layer of hardware cloth on the bottom that actually extends probably about two feet in all directions that it sets on. So rats don't get up and in um, with any of the coops or housing that you choose to put directly on the ground or that they are on the ground themselves. Um, you're going to have to put that hardware cloth all the way around and also extending about two feet out. Um, which is not a huge deal. You just have to kind of plan ahead for that. Okay. The grounded houses are the best for your ducks and your geese, right? Um, so those are great because they, they're nice and low. They can walk easily in and out. Um, it, it's really more suited for ducks and geese, the um, grounded housing. Um, again, if you have chickens, um, you can um, add 
add a little bit more space, depending on, on your grounded, um, you might have to add some, some covered space for your feed and your water. So it doesn't get contaminated. Um, yes, I agree. The A-frame is, is pretty cool. Um, you, the, the housing part where they sleep is elevated. And so if that part is off the ground, um, which is wonderful, it's, 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 I think it's better for, for them overall, um, having that, that elevated like that. And again, we're adding some protection to our run and uh, securing that run. So make sure your run is completely enclosed. Uh, you're going to use the, you can see that we have here, um, this is hardware cloth. Okay. And you're going to use that. You're not going to use um, the typical chick chicken fencing, right? Um, it really is super easy for rats to get through, raccoons to get through. Um, it's, it's super easy to cut. Um, I have had raccoons try to pull the chicken's feathers through it because they can get their hands right in and get in there. Um, so you really want to use the hardware cloth when you're, you're securing your run. Um, netting for the top, chickens are super curious. Um, and so you're going to need some netting on the top so they don't fly out. Um, ducks, not so much. Ducks are going to be pretty chill. Um, and they're going to be like, where's my pool? Um, they're not going to care so much about uh, flying out. Um, you're going to have to dig in the perimeter and put some hardware cloth that goes out and a little bit in. I like to think of it as a T. So you have your hardware cloth going either direction inside and outside. And then, you know, your wall is right here. And what that does is it deters animals from digging up rats, um, dogs, all kinds of, um, we do have weasels in this area, which is really interesting. And the mink, there was a, a mink farm, I guess, here and around here in Pierce County. Um, so things that like to dig up and in, it, they'll hit that, that fencing, that netting. Um, and then you want a spring hook and eye latch. And I'll show you a picture of that. Um, that is gonna be important. I have found, that that is the best locking mechanism for any chicken fowl house out there okay because raccoons they know how to do the latch and pull they can undo those they can turn and pull i mean they once they figure out how to open something it's it's game over the raccoons will totally get in there um but they can't pull lift like it's a whole nother set of skills that they can't quite do. So the spring hook and eye latch is ideal. <clears throat> oops, 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 sorry about that. Um, and I think I have a, a picture of that a little bit later on as well. And then we go into, I believe another poll question. There you go. Uh, what do you think is the most common predator? What do you think is, is the most dangerous for our foul friends. Cats, dogs, rats, raccoons, birds of prey. So birds of prey, we're thinking eagles, hawks, falcons, squirrels. What do you think? I don't know if you can hear my chickens out there, but they're, they're running amok in our yard right now. I don't know if I, yeah, I have that single choice, so I guess we're all answered, so I'll end that and share. Okay. Raccoons and cats. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Thank you. All right. Here are our main predators. Dogs. Regular house dogs. Dogs are number one on the list. Uh, big, small, medium, people friendly, people not friendly, you know, laid back dogs, old dogs, young dogs. Dogs are our biggest predator here in urban spaces. Dogs that get out of their, their fencing, dogs that are running around, um, even, you know, dogs that might be in your household. Um, dogs are the biggest predator in our area. That's top dog number one um, predator. And it's because chickens run around. 
they they run around when they're chased what fun that's so much fun we love chasing things this is great um and some dogs that's their instinct right instinctually they might be a hunting dog right so um it ends up being the dogs dogs really are the biggest predator we have in our area um then number two our friendly what what are you looking at our friendly trash panda um <laughs> our raccoons raccoons are number two um and i gotta tell you raccoons are the biggest jerks because they don't want the chicken they want the eggs so they will um they will kill the chicken and 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 go for the eggs they they will in some cases i feel like sometimes it's just pure entertainment because they don't even take the eggs so raccoons are crafty little devils and so raccoons i would say is number two for us in our area um birds of prey so we've got a lot of hawks we've got eagles cooper hawks red tails um you know so we've got we've got a lot of we got a falcon downtown that likes to nest up on one of the buildings um um they can be an issue um and that's if you have your chickens they are say you have quite a large property and they are running around in that open space they kind of become easy targets so birds of prey will go for an easier easier target rather than like sitting and waiting for that vole to come out or sitting and waiting for the rabbit to pop out um and so um if you have them in an, in an open space um where you know that you have lots of birds of prey um that will become an easy target for them now for across the board all the way across uh pierce county um our norway rat is a nuisance they like to eat all the food they will eat the eggs they will fight with your chicken um, and cause damage. Um, they will, uh, if they're feeling aggressive enough. Um, if you have, uh, there's one particular type of chicken, um, I'm trying to think what it is, but it, it will eat the mice and it will eat and try to attack rats. And chickens will fight back for rats, but um, they do cause a lot of damage. Um, and so, which then makes our fowl more susceptible to the other predators that are around. Um, cats, not so much. Cats really are not a predator to chickens. You would be surprised. Um, of course, when they're baby chicks, yes, because it's like, you know, this is a this is a, a chick chick snack for the cat. We we used to we used to we have a had a cat and a chicken and and the cat would sit right next to our hamster cage with the chicks in it and we would say that they were snack friends, um, <laughs> lovingly of course because the cat was like oh you're your wonderful snack friend, um, but when they get bigger chickens are much smarter and much more protective of themselves than you'd think um we had a a feral cat in our yard um was stalking the chickens and we had about eight chickens at the time and the chickens would they i watched this happen several times where they would go into a little a little a little, a little circle and you would hear them doo -doo 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 -doo, and you were talking and then they would chase that cat they went after that cat. So they, cats are terrified of something that's big, wings out in a flock coming at them. They are terrified. And nine times out of 10, the chicken, the cats are gonna be like, forget this, I'm not doing this ever again, I'm backing down. Um, so, <laughs> so as much as, you know, Cats can be a nuisance in lots of other ways. They're they're not going to attack our chickens. They, I've never had a cat go after a chicken because the chicken is just like, oh, bring it on, cat. I can take you. And then the cat's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm going to take care of the rat, the vole, the mole, the mouse. You know, they're going to go for something else. I'm going to check the chat real quick. All right, we're looking good. Yeah, so just keep in mind, if you do have a dog, you're going to want to introduce the dog to the chick and introduce, introduce them as early as possible. Um, in the end, we ended up having a hound dog who our chicks would just ride on the back of him, you know, and he was like, all right, I guess, I guess I'm a, I'm a chick mobile, you know, and he would take them and he would, you know, walk around with them. So, 
All right, let me go into some potential issues with chicks to adult. So in the first two weeks of a chick, um, they're gonna develop what's called pasty butt. And it's when their feces gets stuck to them and they are no longer able to defecate. And so um, you really have to watch it. It's really prevalent in the first week, sometimes depending on the breed, if it's a, um, a fancy breed um, or something that's quite small, sometimes that, that can happen. And so you've just, with very luke, luke, luke warm water, you hold the chick gently, gently massage, rub uh, that and work that feces off of them, you know, get it off of them. It's, you know, notice it, you know, this is where you're, you're paying attention to them. You're really observing them on a regular basis, get that off, dry them off, put them underneath that heat lamp. And I, I have not had a chick that didn't survive pasty, but, um, I mean, I know some don't, uh, but I, I personally have never had one not survive that little blip in their um, development. If your chickens don't have a particular, they're lacking in some kind of nutrient vitamin, they're, they're feeling too enclosed, um, something's not right, uh, there's a sick chicken, um, plucking and pecking can occur. Other chickens will bully another chicken and pluck their feathers out, peck them. Um, unfortunately, chickens are pretty cannibalistic. And so if you have a chicken that is, is bleeding, the likelihood if you do not remove that chicken, put the, um, put the, the uh, stipic a stalker on there and then um, keep that chicken separated for a little while, they will kill that chicken. Um, it's not because they're mean, it's just that's their instinct. They're getting rid of the weakest link in their in their flock. Um, and it's heartbreaking and it's hard to watch. Um, if you have you didn't see the signs, maybe you were gone all day and it happened. It's really hard, but it does happen. So um, if you do see a chicken that is getting its feathers plucked out um, or getting picked on, um, there are a couple of um, things you can get. Um, there's a peck no more, and it's this cream. It kind of smells grapeish, and it's it's kind of a purpley gray color. And you put that on the area that the feathers are being picked at, and they they tend to stop doing it. The other chickens will stop pecking at it because it's covered. Um, I don't think it tastes very good either. Um, egg eating is a big deal. So if there is not enough, if they don't have open source to calcium, um, your chickens will start eating, eating their own eggs and shells because they're, they're looking for that nutrient balance. Right. Um, and so what you can do is get that, make sure always, always your oyster shell is out there. You have a supplemental oyster shell out there. Um, if you see a chicken eating an egg, stop it immediately because, um, over time, we've had at least two chickens who I didn't catch it soon enough. And then they always ate their own egg. I could not break them of that habit. And, and that was even isolating them um, from the rest of the chickens and like really in the, in the house so I could watch and like take the eggs immediately so she wouldn't eat them. And they, if they get into that habit, it's really, really hard to break the egg eating habit. It's gross, but they're missing something and then it becomes habit. Broodiness is kind of a funny time for hens. Um, <laughs> I think it's funny because they get really big. So when they get really broody, they don't want to leave the nest and they'll make these noises like, Arr! and they'll, they'll, they'll make really horrible noises at you. And then they'll poof up huge. So they're like four times their size and they'll run around, you know, and they get really crazy. Um, and it's because they want to lay on eggs. They want to hatch babies and they want to, they want to, you know, be able to have babies. Well, if you don't have a rooster, <laughs> you're not going to have any, those eggs are not turning into babies. Um, and so what happens is that uh, they, they do snap out of it, but sometimes the, the broodiness will last an extended amount of time and they're not laying when they're broody and they're just being a nuisance and making everybody else upset. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can take them off the nest and put a cold pack on under underbelly because when they get broody, they get really hot on their underbelly because 
they think they're going to be having some babies. They are keeping those eggs warm at that, that, you know, 90, 90 degree temperature, you know, and then it actually kicks up to almost hundred degrees in the last couple of days when they're, they're laying on eggs. So they keep those eggs nice and toasty. Well, you got to cool them off. You got to cool those chickens off. <laughs> I've held them and like made them go up in the air, you know, kind of cooling them off and kicking them off the nest constantly, get them off that nest, get them running around. Um, if you have to put them in a, put them in a little caged area that has an open bottom so they can't sit on a nest, you know, it's a whole thing. I have a, I have a, a chicken broodiness timeout cage that I'll put them in that has an open bottom. And so they get a lot of air and it takes normally about two days to break them of the broodiness. So it's a strange time with hens and you'll notice if you get them or you know, that it's, it's really hilarious to watch them. They're just, they just rally it crazy. Um, flying chickens do fly chickens, depending on the breed climb. They're pretty awesome. Um, so that's when they're going back to their instinctual. I want to roost in a tree. I want to climb and I want to get over and I want to be in a tree type situation. Um, I have found that clipping the wings, it's not really effective if you do it if if you do it wrong you can do a lot of damage um the if you cut too close it's really hard to stop the bleeding I and mean, eventually it stops but it's like clipping your nails and you go too far down and it starts bleeding it with the dogs and cats and things like that so just avoid it it really is not necessary um if you have netted the top of your your run you'll keep them in. Um, they're they're going to want to fly around. It's instinctual. Ducks, they have to be taught to fly. So we're going to get some issues to ducks. Um, are there any questions about chick potential issues? Um, any other questions you want to ask about potential issues with chicks and chickens? Because um, now would be the time to, to type those in the chat. And I'll wait a, I'll wait a sec here, see if we get any because I know, I know they can. Because we have so few on, if they uh, want to ask a question rather than put it in the chat, um, you could raise your hand, click on the uh, bar at the bottom that says raise hand and we can call on you. Oh, okay, Janet, you'll have to watch that because that's more difficult okay. for me to watch. Um, so, so that would be awesome. Um, some potential issues with ducklings to adult, the um, dirty drinking water and, and it can really be an issue for ducks in general, keeping that drinking water area clean. Because again, ducks are filter feeders, right? And so they're gonna filter in and they're gonna eat and then they're gonna go into their water, right? And so a little bit of mud, a little bit of food is always gonna be dropping into that drinking water. And so changing that out daily is going to be really important because you don't want that to sour, to ferment, to go bad. Um, the soil might harbor, you know, any kind of parasites, things like that. So they're drinking water. You really need to change it out every day. Um, I change mine out every day. Um, and I've actually got several different drinking stations <laughs> for the ducks um, when they're out and about. And uh, um, just so they have lots of opportunities to filter out um, while they're doing their business. And so you really do need to keep that nice and clean um, for them. Um, ducks do go broody. Um, if you do not have a drake, you will not have babies. Um, but ducks, they really don't stay in that broody in this stage. And they don't get crazy like the chickens do they're not going to make any weird noises at you they're not gonna puff up and be like ah, godzilla you know they're not gonna they're not gonna go nuts on you um the ducks are in general just kind of want to stay in the nest and they just kind of hunker in and they're really mellow and they kind of just sit there they might hiss at you they might go Shh. they might hiss but they 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 don't stay broody very long once they realize that the you know you're collecting their eggs and they're you know nothing's going on they get out of it really really quickly um and and it only generally happens you know in springtime april-ish may uh, march and april is when i see my ducks go broody a little bit um and then that's really it i've got several who are, are quite old our our puddles is is seven years old and and she goes broody <laughs> She didn't go broody last year, so I don't know. She may or may not go broody this year, but she, you know, she, it was no big deal. Flying. Now, the coolest thing about ducks, um, if you don't teach them how to fly, they won't. 
<laughs> so um, ducks and geese actually need to be taught by the adults how to fly. And so they'll look and they'll mimic um, their adult parents and their the adults around them on how to fly. So if you don't have any ducks that are flying around, like all the time in their space, they're not gonna fly. So it's not a big deal. That means your fencing can or enclosure can be shorter if you want to. It doesn't have to be super tall. Um, and depending on the size of the duck, and I'm gonna put in goose too, because it's the same, um, you know, you know, four feet, it's tall enough, quite frankly, um, because they just, they're not gonna fly out. And if you didn't wanna put a topper on top, a netting on top, you don't have to, they're not gonna fly out unless you're teaching them how to fly. Like that's on you. <laughs> you teach them how to fly that, that was that was something you brought on yourself but i don't know anybody who's teaching their ducks how to fly um now our the goose i have has been watching the canadian geese because we have a lot of canadian geese in the area that i'm at and he can take air but he can't fly fly so he he learned he learned a little bit from those canadian geese um but he can't fly fly which is kind of funny the biggest injuries your ducks are going to have are going to be foot and leg injuries. Okay, so I have noticed with the smaller breeds, you're going to have less injuries. With breeds that are quite large, there are more susceptible to foot and leg injuries. Now there is a, um, the, they're called the evergreen avian and exotic pets. And um, they are up north, they're in Renton. They do take and see ducks and they'll see waterfowl and they'll see chickens, um, but they do, they, they are wonderful and they will, they'll see if you have any issues. Um, so sometimes the ducks, they'll be walking and you know, they've got their webbed feet and maybe they stepped on something and it, it gave them a little scratch or it punctured or it made something so small that you wouldn't even be able to see it, right? Maybe they bumped into something and they got poked. Well, because they're in and out of water all the time, sometimes they do get infected and then you'll see them kind of doing the limpy waddle. Um, and if it's not taken care of, um, you know, then if it doesn't go away, right, then you'll, you will have to take it in. And there, there is a course of different antibiotics, depending on the bacterial infection. Um, you know, there's different things that can be done. So it's not as if, you know, you're, <laughs> you're going to have to get rid of your, your ducks if they get injured and have an infection. Um, I've had two that have had some pretty severe foot and leg infections uh, from punctures from getting a bacterial infection um, due to uh, getting a puncture and then just doing their thing. Um, and it did take about six months of, of applying those antibiotics and the bacterial creams and things like that, but they're a-okay now and they've been good for about a year. So um, just watching those feet and those limbs um, because they are susceptible. And that's where you want inside of your kiddie pools, you're gonna wanna have a step depending on how high that side is, you're gonna to have to have a step on the outside so they can step up into the pool and have some kind of step. I use um, bricks in the pool itself. So they have a step up out of the pool. And I'm finding that I have less, that ducks are struggling less to get in and out of the pools, even with a shorter um, eight inch to 10 inch side. And they, they, you, they, they're, I'm seeing less potential for injury, so. Any questions? All right, now we're doing good. All right. So that's kind of the nitty gritty of, of how to um, get yourself started. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share the list. I've got a good chicken list um, for um, from Garden Sphere. We have our availability for this for this year. Now you can see that we've already had two hatches in January and in February. And we are going to be having another hatch come in that will be available March 24th, so next week. And then basically every month until September, there are new chicks coming in pretty regularly. And so um, I really like, they have this availability pamphlet 
in the store. So if you want to pick it up and take it, it's also available on the website. Um, and it will be available as well through the Enviro House with Janda. So, um, you know, it's great information, just gives you a quick quick check off list on what you need. And um, all of our chicks at Garden Sphere, we make sure that all of the chicks are vaccinated, which is really important. Um, Merrix is pretty rampant in Pierce County and in King County, um, Merrix disease. And um, it, it really, it's really, really disheartening when you know you've raised a, a chick to a chicken and then you, it suddenly suddenly dies um and now we are really lucky here in pierce county that we have the wsu extension we have their avian um laboratory here and so they you can bring if you if you do have a chicken that suddenly dies you can bring that chicken to the wsu extension in puyallup and they have an avian avian building and you can get a necropsy done on your chicken so you know exactly what happened or exactly what was the cause of that that death um, because that can that can impact the rest of your flock um, and so um, we have found that that Merrick's really is the number one that and respiratory uh, illness uh, pneumonia um, in the winter months is, is really another one so. Um, so we always at Garden Sphere, we make sure that they are vaccinated uh, from the hatchery. They are also sexed. That means they're female. Um, there are, you know, two to three outliers each season out of all of these chicks that happen to be a rooster. And of course, you know, at Garden Sphere, if you get a chick from us and you happen to be that, that one, two percent that just, oh, you got a roo. Come, go ahead, you can go ahead and bring it back if you if you purchased it from um, from Garden Sphere. Um, that kind of makes uh, that that does make our chicks have a more healthy start. Um, the vaccinations and that we we make sure they're they're ready to go. We also um, give them the uh, certified organic feed, so that does make a difference. Um, the availability. I'm going to go through these chickens really quick um, because you notice that we've got some standards. We've got rare, and then we have ultra rare. Now, some of the easiest standard um, chickens to start off with, if you've never had chickens before, are the Buff Orpington and the Black Australorp, the Golden Buff, and the Easter Egger. They're, they tend to have a lot of personality, um, and especially the Buff Orpington, I like to call it the golden retriever of the, the chicken world because it is super personable. It's fast to imprint on you, uh, you onto them, and you will have a friend for life. Um, the Buff, or Buff Orpingtons are pretty, pretty amazing. Um, Bard Rocks, the Sussex and the Brahma and the Rhode Island are, are really good layers. Um, they are very independent. Um, the, the, especially the Rhode Island Reds. The Rhode Island Reds are, are very independent chickens. And so they're going to want to make all the decisions for themselves. And you know, if you're doing something and you call them over, if you don't have treats, well, they're just gonna keep doing what they wanna do. So um, that's, they're, they're a great starter though, for someone who, who um, is looking for a very easy to care for chicken. A Rhode Island Red is a good one. Now, some of these, these rares. Um, so uh, I have a blue splash. I've actually have two splash Morans and they are a hoot and a half. They lay very reliably and their personalities are really big. And I know this says quiet, but neither of them are quiet. They are super chatty. Now you do have to remember that chickens do have their own personalities and they, e even if it says that they're quiet, um, you really have to go for individuals. They're just like us. We, we are all individuals with different personalities and, and some of us are quieter than others. Same for the chickens. Now, both of my blue splash are very chatty and they're super active. Um, they are, probably one of my most active chickens. Um, I have the, um, uh, there's a, oh, I've got several of these. Um, the, what's really funny is that the, the lavender Orpington 
is just an Orpington that's a different color, um, has the same traits as the Buff Orpington. They're really good layers. They're really fantastic. Any of the Orpingtons, no matter what color, are really lovely. Um, the Wyandots are really friendly and laid back. Um, they tend not to get too skittish, um, and they're they're real they're real friendly as well. Um, I've got a couple of blue Americanas. They are troublemakers. <laughs> when it says goofy, yeah, they are. They're friendly. They're they are troublemakers. They like to cause trouble. They like to figure out creative ways to get out of the run constantly. Um, beautiful layers though. Their layers are are they they lay so reliably. Um, and they they're really a good size egg. I would say it's a medium large egg for those blue Americanas. And they are a hoot and a half. They they get in so much trouble. Um, it's pretty funny. Um, two of the chickens that I I know get very broody, okay, and broody frequently. Um, the black Australorp, um, super chill chicken, but they do get broody very frequently. Um, that's that's the only thing with them. They 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 do get really broody very 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 often. Um, and my um. And my black Morans, they also get very broody often and they, <laughs> they make the funniest noises. Um, and then the buff Orpington as well. Now, one that I have never had go broody ever, Easter Egger. My Easter Eggers never, in all the years I've had Easter Eggers, and we're going on almost 20 years now, and they, they never get broody ever. They're like, forget it. We will lay the eggs, but we are pretty and we are not taking care of babies. Like they just, they don't have, they have no interest at all. Um, and my Rhode Island Reds, funny enough, my Rhode Island Reds, they never go broody. They have, I have had Rhode Island Reds since the very beginning and never broody. They, they, they just like the Easter Eggers have no interest at all in laying on eggs and having babies. So if you're looking for chickens that, you know, are notoriously um, not broody. The Rhode Island Red and the Easter Egg are, are really good choices for that. Um, one that was actually a really good mom. I've got a, a couple of roosters because I'm in the county um, and my Bard Rock was a really good mom. My Buff Orpington, really good mom. They really take care of those chicks and teach them everything they need to know. And um, fantastic mothers, the, the Bard Rocks and the Buff Orpingtons are excellent, excellent mothers. Um, so I think, I think that's, that'll do. Um, are there any questions or um, any needs? Anything that uh, I can help you with before we, before we go today? I don't see anything else coming in, but um, <clears throat> because we do have a small audience, if you want me to email you, did you have the list of resources? No, I did not. Okay. I did if you not. want, if you want me to email you the list of resources that has some good books and some links on it, um, I can do that. And um, I can also email you the list, the starter list of chicks that um, Jenny was just going through from Garden Spheres. So if those of you who are in today um, want to send me an email, ehouse at cityoftacoma.org, um, I do have your email addresses and I can send those out to you. Yeah. Um, and then um, I put my information in the chat, Jenny's information, gardensphere.biz. Um, <clears throat> And then we did not talk about municipal codes. So not in this one. Yeah. If um, and that are we doing that in the next one in the coops? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, I but, know that um, in the city, city of Tacoma, you can have six without any question, six chickens or six fowl. So you could have three ducks and three chickens. Um, it's just fowl. Um, and then you can have up to 10 with the permission of your neighbors. So if your neighbors are cool with you having 10 fowl, then you're good to go. 
And I think one of our attendees is Furcrest, if I remember correctly. And um, I was just looking online and I could not find the Furcrest ordinance, but um, you can probably get that by calling City Hall if, if uh, you don't have that information. Um, so if you uh, want these resources, either check back with us for um, the COOP webinar or let me know and I'll email them to you. And thank you very much for attending. Um, and if no one else has anything, we will close off. And Jenny, I'll see you at one o'clock for COOPs. Yes, thank you. And thank you for everybody for coming. Thanks. All right, bye-bye.